Thank you for coming. I hear there's like an eclipse tonight. Is there any sun to be eclipsed out there? Shoot. Oh, is it? You can see it? Nice. Well, thank you for being here. You can here. see it, but there are, are clouds. <laughs> we are in Portland. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm Krista Wessel. I'm the morning host of All Classical FM, which I hope is your favorite radio station. I'm glad to hear that. Thank you. Uh, and this, of course, is our music director and conductor, Carlos Calmar. Good evening, everybody. On kind of a, uh, not quite so rainy yet, but we're, we're descending into the raininess. It's kind of nice to have a kind of dark-hued program tonight. If you see in your program notes, there's a paragraph, I don't know whether you've seen it, about darkness as the theme of this program tonight. Oh, see... There you see that I don't read program. <laughs> <laughs> oh, darkness. That's an interesting idea. I well, wouldn't have said so. Um, clearly, the opening piece, Black Gondola. That's very dark. That's very dark. It's about a black gondola going down the canals of Venice mm -hmm. with a coffin on board. Yeah. You can't get much darker than that. Actually, now that, that you mention it's a piece about, uh, the program is about darkness, I think, okay, yes, I can see that. Because the first piece is dark, the second piece is about Los Angeles, mainly at night. Uh oh <laughs> <laughs> Freud would have liked that comment. <laughs> and uh, the, the nocturne, well, it's a nocturne. It's a night piece. And right of spring, yeah. Okay, it's a dark, I would have said this program is about energy, but... Dark energy. Dark energy. So, the first piece, uh, John Adams, Black Gondola, actually, of course, it's not a piece by John Adams. It's a piece by Franz Liszt. And I did not, uh, this is a first performance for the Oregon Symphony, and I've also never, never seen this piece before. Uh, because originally this is a piece for piano only, and I, when I read it and I looked at the score and what John Adams did with it, I thought like, this is actually interesting because this is a piece that is very austere. There is not so much music in it, so if you think that there is not so much music in it and you have in front of you um, a rather small orchestra, but it's still an orchestra, how difficult must it be for a pianist to pull this piece off? Because there are, in part, in many parts, there are only single notes, meaning there is, uh, there is yes, there is a melodic line, but there is no harmony to it. So you are pretty much as naked as you can be. And uh, a piano being a kind of percussive instrument where it is so hard to actually sustain a line and having a piece in front of you uh, that is not only dark, but it's also very slow. Uh, it's, it's an odd thing. <laughs> and the piece is, it's, it's, a v it's a very good piece of music. It's, it's a strange piece of music. It's moody. Oh, yeah. And it's not the rousing overture you expect a big concert to start off with. Well, it's, uh, at the end of this, uh, this evening, you, you are going to, or I tell you in advance, of course, um, you're going to see that the format of the two halves of the program are absolutely the same. It's a darkish and slow piece, and then followed by a completely crazy music that utilizes a huge orchestra and has a lot of notes. That's how the evening works. But of course, the black gondola, this idea of um, that something, the color black, which absorbs the light, and then there is the idea of ending life and death and the canals of Venice where everything is spooky anyway, uh, and on top of that, Franz Liszt, uh, in a piece like this, utilizes harmonies that actually Richard Wagner could have written this. It's very, it's harmonically a little bit challenging to understand where he goes with his idea, and in a way the music always travels downwards, which is obvious when you think about a coffin, because you are always going into the ground, into your grave. So I couldn't imagine a happier start to a concert <laughs> than this one. 
It reminds me actually a bit in color of the Sibelius Symphony of last week. Kind of dark and yeah, very true. lush. And very rich. true, but uh, I mean, very true, however, for whoever, uh, for all of you who have seen last uh, weekend's performance of Sibelius number no. seven, I would say compared uh, to the Black Gondola, Sibelius is like happy and light and bright. This is like, woo. I mean, I, I mean it's not only the, the, the piece that Franz Liszt wrote, but um, the way Adams orchestrates it is, is it's very, it's economic and it's very intelligent how he does this because he utilizes only um, instruments in the orchestras who kind of sound black, bass clarinet, bassoon, low horn, and all of that. So it gives this growling material. And whenever there is this attempt of the violins to go a little bit higher, it ends up in a very dramatic way. There is the dramatic climax of, let's say, as we are talking about a funeral procession of despair, of, uh, of anguish, because somebody has died, but then everything calms down until the music um, pretty much ends how it started, with single melody, no harmony, nothing. Just disappears. And then after that piece is over, about 800 musicians load up on this stage, it seems. It's a huge orchestra for this John Adams piece. Well, um, I have to tell you a, a couple of things that actually if I may have nothing to do with the piece itself or whether they were, were kind of done because of the piece. You know, um, we here in Portland, Oregon, we have, um, an, let's say, a leading team at the Oregon Symphony who is not only incredibly oriented toward artistic excellency, but everybody, um, marketing, the president of the Oregon Symphony Lane, myself, we are also oriented towards utilizing our donors' money very well. So what we did actually something that I can say, although I participated in it, that is really smart. When you put in a program the right of spring with the orchestra of the Oregon Symphony, you have to hire a lot of musicians. So you will have them in the second half anyway. And so what did we do? We did the smart thing. We said, oh, guys, you're here anyway. Let's play another of those humongous pieces. And I wish I would be so savvy as to have now half of my percussion section uh, with me to present to you what is uh, right behind me, because um, I think you have never seen in a concert, at least not during the time I have been here, a uh, stage that is as full as this one, with percussion instrument. I think your principal percussionist, Neil DuPont, told me there's 60 individual pieces of percussion back there for the John Adams piece. And oh. six percussionists, I think, and they're all playing multiple instruments at once. Well, the thing is, usually it works like this, that you have multiple instruments, and the fun for the audience is mainly not only the sounds that these percussion instruments make, but also seeing the percussionists run around. <laughs> Get from one to the other. Now, this is a very particular case of uh, a piece of music on this magnificent stage because you know how this... Uh, you might not ever think about something like that, but um, we have a wonderful crew. Um, whom you mainly see when they put up a piano, if, when we have a pianist as a soloist. You see the crew of the house, um, and uh, Chris, our stage manager, and they are all managed wonderful. The way they work is they set up the orchestra, sparing a little room in the back, and then they put uh, everything else in there, which is a couple of uh, percussion instruments. Not in this case. In this case, with, of course, the help of our principal percussionist, Neil Ponte, who also in that sense is a brilliant man, and a, he really thinks this through, because without his input, this would not be possible, or it would probably cost us 45 minutes in the intermission. Um, he said, <laughs> there should be no chair on this stage 
until we, the percussionists, have loaded our instruments. So what happened was the reverse order. First the percussion, which is huge, and then the rest. And uh, as I could say, this is an evening where you see that our musicians really like each other very much because <laughs> they are it's tight on stage. And in addition to a bunch of unusual percussion instruments, you also have uh, the unusual addition of a saxophone player. In fact, at times, City Noir by John Adams almost sounds like a saxophone concerto in parts. In fact, he stands well, in uh, portions. Well, Tim, the, 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 the saxophone player whom you are going to hear is actually an astounding musician, and uh, he will blow you away. Uh, Tim McAllister, um, he, in a way, the piece, the saxophone part that you're going to hear tonight was written for him. And so when the piece was premiered in the year 2009 in Disney Hall by Los Angeles Philharmonic with Gustavo Dudamel um, at the helm, he was the soloist. And so of course he tries to play this piece wherever he can go. This piece has not been performed that extensively. And to, during the rehearsal, Tim approached me and said, you know, John Adams approached me during the rehearsal time back in 2009 and said, for the three big solos, could you please stand? And it makes a lot of sense because at the end of the day, you will realize that the piece City Noir by John Adams has a lot to do with jazz. And if you imagine in, an, in, a, in a jazz setting, there is always the soloist, there is always this five or six musician who play jazz, and then there is this soloist spot on him or her, who stands up and plays a big solo. And that is how this piece also works. It's a piece in three movements, and of course the thing that I believe you are going to be as astonished is the energy that comes at you. It already opens, if we, uh, Krista already mentioned that sometimes in a concert you want to, the first piece should kind of start with a big bang. Well. Okay, the first piece is the black gondola, it doesn't start with a big bang, but boy, City Noir starts with a big bang. And um, City Noir is a piece that has something to do, not, so, not only of course with the city of Los Angeles, but also with what the city of Los Angeles means to many artists. It's a city that, as John Adams puts it, on the surface everything is wonderful. The weather is great, people look fantastic. It's very sunny there. Hollywood is around the corner, so beautiful people walk around. But there is this other side underneath it, which is the side that uh, people like Raymond Chandler described in his novels, that is about uh, the dark side of Los Angeles and crime and so on. So the piece you're going to hear, the, the, um, the City Noir, is very moody. And yes, it starts with a ba big bang, but then it calms down. And it's like, somehow I have the association in parts of the first movement that it is, uh, it's a city full of walking, rushing people. Because you hear kind of a little bit of percussion setting up a mood of jazz and then the entire woodwind section, together with the saxophone, go completely crazy. So many notes. And it goes up and down and up and down, and sometimes it happens that in a very brutal way, the, um, the brass has like hammers something. So it's kind of a very interesting way of writing music. And of course, at the end of the first movement, after maybe here and there calming down, everything climaxes and falls apart. The music falls apart and we are in the second movement, which is the slow movement. And here, um, even more than only in the second movement, happens something that John Adams does so brilliantly. What you are going to hear is you will think that uh, several uh, musicians in the orchestra mainly Aaron Lavier, in this case, our principal trombone, is improvising. I mean, because he kind of sits there, we set a mood very slowly of music, and he starts kind of like, 
he takes off a little bit and he gets, so to speak, increasingly agitated. And you think, wow, this is a solo, he's kind of inventing it on the spot. No, he plays exactly what John Adams wrote. There is, it just sounds like an improvisation. And this improvisation of, um, called This Song Is For You, that's the name of the second movement, is, it, it, in a way it starts a little bit like a love song in the darkness, and then it grows on a very weird trip and gets very brutal. Uh, and and again, the music collapses. Actually, this one collapses just in one in one second. It's just over. When you think like you have no idea where the rhythm goes and what is actually going on, it's just big and loud. It stops, and then the song is for you. Kind of dissipates. And now we we'll get to the last movement, which is um, very clearly. This is actually I would dare to say. <laughs> Uh, the easiest to understand of the of the three movements because it starts with this. Um, I don't know if we if you sometimes have seen a very large city from above. At least it's an. This is only an inter association that I have. When you see when you are in a big tower and on the 60th floor of a building and you look down into the traffic, and everything is in motion, but it is a gazillion of lights. In a way, the beginning of the last movement works like this. It is, it is very peaceful but busy. And after that, uh, when peaceful and busy is done, we get into a section where you can admire very slowly paced some of our percussion instruments. And then the second big, big solo that sounds like improvising happens. This time, it's Jeff Work, principal trumpet. Music, mounts, and energy. And then comes um, when the, this energy climaxes, then starts the real fun. Because now you're going to hear at first stuff that you think, oh, right of spring is already happening, but we missed the intermission. <laughs> uh, but it's exactly like it, it really is with these changing meters and these free accents and so on. But of course, it's John Adams, and it takes it takes off, and it's just fast. I would say fast and furious music, and um, he, he pretty much keeps that pace. Tim McAllister will go crazy in this part, and at the end, it's the orchestra playing so many notes that I remember one day uh, back uh, when I was playing, uh, when I was conducting Rachmaninoff's third piano concerto that my soloist at the time told me how many notes are in Rachmaninoff's piano concerto for the pianist. It was over 32,000. Uh, I thought like, well, this piece is probably even more notes for each individual. It's crazy. And then it's, yeah, it will take you into a really fun dancing mood. Unconventional dancing, perhaps. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's... You know, the, I guess the title, City Noir, and we're talking about film noir and that kind of um, uncomfortable feeling that comes with the noir genre. This music kind of sounds dangerous in a way. This music actually is dangerous. Uh, I mean... <laughs> There are elements, first of all, this element that I told you in the first movement when the woodwinds go so many notes and there is this hammering of accents that actually um, the association there is danger. And then there is this, <laughs> after this rite of spring that I told you about episode in the third movement happens, you will hear, at least my association is people calling and then all of a sudden uh, people honking in their cars because it's and it very rudely very like <laughs> and 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 that's incredible and yes with the mountain energy the role of the brass in this piece in part is just to top the energy that is anyway there and that is um, actually i think it's great fun
It's, I, don't, I wouldn't say this is a dangerous piece in the sense that you are like, please don't do anything to me. It's just a fun piece with a lot of dangerous element that you, like in the film noir, you sit there and you are astounded at what uh, the directors came up with, but it's still a very enjoyable movie that you are seeing. And I guess danger is kind of an element in The Rite of Spring, too. Probably, um, well, please don't riot tonight is what I'm asking. <laughs> you know, at the premiere, it's hard to talk about The Rite of, the spring, Rite of spring without talking about the famous riot at the premiere. Um, so we're counting on audience behavior. Also for the musicians, it's dangerous music. I mean, it's hard music. And to conduct, I suspect, it's dangerous as well. Stravinsky is not easy on you. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, it's it's the Stravinsky's Rite of Spring is hard, really difficult. Uh, and uh, you might not know this, but you, or you might ask yourself uh, when you see a conductor, how do you practice? And actually, what does a conductor practice? So it might happen that you think uh, we, Aside from studying our score, we stand in front of the mirror and see whether does that look good <laughs> or stuff like that. And admittedly, I, um, it's not true. At least I can tell you, I, I never practice, never did, uh, in the sense of what looks good, what the, with one exception, two actually, which, and one of them is Rite of Spring. And the, I didn't practice in front of a mirror. I practice while I'm reading and like, oh my God, this is <laughs> Because, uh, so what is so insanely difficult about the Rite of Spring? It is, it's a piece of, let's say, 34 minutes of music. And it gets really difficult in the last 10 maybe only eight minutes, and it gets incredibly, even more so, the last three minutes are, are quite, quite, uh, you have to pay a lot of attention to that. And the reason is it's changing meters, meaning each bar is different, which makes it hard for everybody. And the difficulty is uh, there is no pattern, because yeah, we all can conduct uh, or play things in changing meters if there is a pattern, meaning these are four bars and then they are repeated again and then they are repeated again. It's fine. There is no pattern in this and it, it's really tricky. It is so difficult that even some conductors rewrote the score for themselves in order to avoid the, this fun part. Which, as musicians told me, I've never seen that, although I know which conductors have done that. It's one of those moments when musicians, uh, and when musicians see their music, the conducting pattern of the, 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 the man standing in front of them has nothing to do with the music, and they look, get an upbeat, and then they close their eyes and never look again at the conductor. That is dangerous. <laughs> And that is dangerous. Okay, admittedly, another fun part of uh, being a conductor in the Rite of Spring is, I, I don't tell you any secret, ask any musician. Can a conductor cause a train wreck? In a symphony by Mozart, oh, you cannot do that. Simply, you miss a beat, you do something, uh, yeah, it will go on. In a symphony by Beethoven, even in symphonies by Brahms, nothing will really happen unless the start of the symphony or whatever doesn't work, fine. In this piece, right of spring, oh boy, you can cause a train wreck, big ones. <laughs> and um, yeah, it's kind of a challenge, but you know what? Uh, the fun part of right of spring is um, that everybody on stage, the musicians, know it backwards. Everybody, every musician who plays in an orchestra knows right of spring, it's bloody hard, practice it. And you memorize it throughout the years. So in the end, the miracle happens that, uh, yes, you have to rehearse right of spring very meticulously, but not as much as you think. We spend for sure more time on City Noir. Noir. At the end of the day, City Noir, way more notes, 
way more nodes. Harder technically, but rhythmically, by far not as hard as Rite of Spring. So what we are talking about in the end, I also have to mention that, is this will be, this, this is the last concert of our season at the Oregon Symphony, and I cannot imagine a better display of artistic excellency done by an orchestra than this program, because you will hear dark, you will hear fast, you will hear rhythmic, you will hear virtuosity, you will hear lush, you will hear the Nocturne by uh, Antonin Dvorak, which is stunningly beautiful, which means that the orchestra, in this case it's a, it's a string piece, will be required to play in so many different ways. And um, for me, for, if I can talk uh, just one sentence about, uh, n it's not about my role, it's more about, uh, I've conducted Rite of Spring many times. Uh, I got as lucky as to do that. And of course you have, when after you have survived the first time, um, you have a certain, maybe a certain way of doing uh, things and you establish a certain pattern as how you see things. This time, um, with uh, this wonderful orchestra who's music director, I am, I must say I've, I just realized for my own pleasure that I've changed my mind in some things. I, I don't know why this is, but I would say that I got, in comparison to the old days, I got a little more lyrical, more, yeah, it's more, it, it sings a little bit more. However, um, this is what I, this was the last thing I told the orchestra in the rehearsal when we were rehearsing this crazy last eight minutes that are so high energy, high octane, I told them, you know, maybe I'm getting old, and so everything is a little more mellow. But, you know, from this moment on, I want it so rude, it has to be a bloody mess. So I hope you enjoy, in the end, not only the lyrical part of our interpretation of Rite of Spring, but the bloody mess will be a real <laughs> bloody mess. I hope you're looking forward to this concert tonight. It's going to be a display of virtuosity like you've likely never seen on this stage. Carlos Calmer, always a delight. Krista Wessel. Mm -hmm.